Got any questions for me? JM is the key. This is John Mendoza and welcome to my vlog. The first symptoms patients feel is the feeling of bloatedness or abdominal fullness. Patients usually complain of subjective tightness with clothes and belts. This should not be confused with abdominal distension, which is an objective measurement of an increase in abdominal girth. Abdominal swelling is a manifestation of different etiologies. Conveniently, we can generally approach this by considering the classic six Fs. Flatus, fat, fluid, fetus, feces, and fatal growth. First is flatus. The abdomen is normally composed of 200 milliliter volume of gas. Increase of gas beyond 200 might elicit a symptom of bloatedness and may come mainly from two concerns. First is excessive aerophagia. Bloatedness is usually accompanied by belching. The second are factors that may affect bacterial metabolism, which are the presence of excess fermentable substances. However, in patients with IBS, the feeling of bloatedness doesn't come from increased volume, but a dysfunction of gas transit. Abdominal fat is the most common manifestation of excess in calorie intake. This is usually associated from a poor diet and sedentary lifestyle. Although it is possible that increase in deposition of abdominal fat is pathologic, such as in Cushing syndrome, it rarely represents as a sole symptom. Fluid Abdominal swelling may also occur when there is excessive amount of fluid consumption. Of more concern is the accumulation of fluid within the abdominal cavity and problems with absorption and secretion. Examples are your ascites caused by cirrhosis or malignancy. By fluid, we refer to abdominal ascites often due to liver diseases but sometimes congestive heart failure. Fetus. It can also occur in pregnant women where there is physiologic increase of abdominal girth usually occurring within the first 12 to 24 weeks of gestation signifying the expansion of the uterus towards the abdomen. Feces. When there is an increased volume of retained feces in the rectum decreasing intestinal motility, it produces a feeling of swelling. Increased amount of feces in the colon may contribute to the sensation. The concern is usually constipation or intestinal obstruction. Lastly, we have fatal growth, which is a growth of an abdominal mass which may manifest as an abdominal swelling, especially if they are large in size. Enlargement of size in the abdomen such as the liver, spleen, and part of the bladder may also produce swelling. Examples include neoplasms. I can't emphasize enough the importance of good history. Patients should be questioned regarding symptoms suggestive of malignancy. These include weight loss, night sweats, and anorexia. Inability to pass tool or flatus together with nausea or vomiting suggest bowel obstruction, severe constipation, or an ileus. Increased eructation and flatus may point towards aerophagia or increased intestinal production of gas. Patients should be questioned about risk factors for symptoms of chronic liver diseases. These include alcohol use and jaundice, which suggests ascites. They should also be asked for other medical conditions including heart failure and tuberculosis. Physical examination. In your assessment, you should look for signs of systemic disease. The presence of lymphadenopathy, especially in the supraclavicular area, suggests metastatic abdominal malignancy. Care should also be taken during cardiac examination to evaluate the elevation of jugular venous pressure. Cosmal sign and pericardial knock may also be seen in heart failure. Spider angiomas, palmar erythema, Dilated superficial veins around the umbilicus and gynecomastia suggest chronic liver disease. Abdominal examination consists of inspection, auscultation, percussion, and palpation. Abdominal swelling caused by intestinal gas can be differentiated from swelling caused by liquid or solid mass by percussion. An abdomen filled with gas is tympanitic, whereas an abdomen containing a massive fluid is dull. Laboratory evaluation and imaging modalities are centered around the specific suspicion of etiology. Abdominal x-ray is used to detect gas and dilated loops of bowel. As you can see in the picture, the normal bowel gas has very variable in appearance and is black in x-ray. In this example, the wavy rugae of the stomach wall can be seen. A short segment of the colon is prominent but is not frankly dilated. Fecal matter is visible in the right hemicolon. 
Next is abdominal ultrasound, which is indicated for the detection of fluid as low as 100 milliliters organomegaly or presence of masses. Fluid can be seen as hypoechoic or black, while masses are seen as hyperechoic or white. However, it is inadequate to detect changes located in the retroperitoneum or detect pancreatic lesions because of the overlying bowel gas. In these cases, we can use an abdominal CT scan, which is appropriate for suspicions and monitoring of malignancies and pancreatic diseases. It is capable of detecting retroperitoneal abnormalities and minute changes such as seen in portal hypertension. We can also do paracentesis, which I will be discussing more in detail later. As a general principle, laboratory tests must be guided by the suspicion of organs involved correlated with a patient's clinical picture. If the organ of suspicion is the liver, we should test for hepatocellular integrity using AST or ALT, for excretion, ALP, bilirubin or GGT, and for synthetic function, serum albumin and the prothrombin time. For the pancreas, we have serum biomarkers such as your lipase and your amylase. For appendix and spleen, you should order a CBC and a peripheral blood smear. And for the stomach and intestine, fecal occult blood test and stool culture. Ascites. Peritoneal fluid is considered significant if it is greater than 50 to 75 milliliters and is termed as ascites. As you can see in the picture, the ascites has excess buildup of fluid in the abdomen. Ascites pathogenesis is mainly divided into two broad categories. We have ascites related to cirrhotic changes and ascites formation unrelated to cirrhotic changes. 80% of all ascites occur in relation to cirrhotic liver and represents a distinct pathway of ascites production. Central to the pathogenesis of cirrhotic ascites formation is the increased hepatic resistance by cirrhotic changes. These include fibrosis, smooth muscle contraction in the liver, which results to increased portal vein pressure or your portal hypertension. Thus, in the setting of portal hypertension, backflow and stasis of vasodilatory substances such as your nitric oxide begin to accumulate. This causes tanknic vasodilation with resultant hyperperfusion of the renal system. In this sense, the RAAS is activated, leading to aggressive fluid retention. This excess retained blood volume is thought to leak out directly from both liver surface and mesenteric vessels. This latter mechanism is due to increased hydrostatic and vascular wall permeability and concurrently decreased oncotic fluid retention. The usual cause of acidic formation aside from cirrhotic changes is usually due to peritoneal malignancy, infection, or pancreatic disease. The main pathogenesis in malignancy is due primarily to increased production of protein-rich fluid and secondary sequential osmotic changes. The volume of protein-rich fluid is increased beyond the resorptive capacity due to the presence of fluid secreting tumors. The high oncotic pressure then induces transfer of extracellular fluid towards the peritoneum, further contributing to ascites formation. Evaluation of ascites is best done by paracentesis. A gauge 22 syringe is usually used. Patient is positioned supine, and usual sites are 2 cm below the umbilicus or 5 cm superior to the anterior superior iliac spine. The left lower quadrant is favored due to greater depth of ascites and a thinner abdominal wall. Gross examination of the peritoneal fluid can give clues about the ascites. Turbid may mean tumor or infection. White or milky may mean triglyceride level of greater than 200 which is a hallmark of chylus ascites. If it is dark, it may mean high bilirubin. And black may mean pancreatic necrosis or metastatic melanoma. Acetic fluid should be sent for measurement of albumin and total protein levels, cell and differential counts, and if infection is suspected, gram stain and culture with inoculation in the blood culture bottles at the patient's bedside to maximize the yield. Serum albumin level should be measured simultaneously to permit calculation of serum ascites albumin gradient. This is useful in distinguishing ascites that is caused by hypertension from non-portal hypertensive ascites. This reflects the pressure within the hepatic sinusoids and correlates with the hepatic venous pressure gradient. 
This can be calculated by subtracting the acetic albumin concentration from the serum albumin level. Shown on the slide is the algorithm for the diagnosis of ascites according to the serum ascites albumin gradient. Initial treatment for cirrhotic ascites is restriction of sodium intake to 2 grams per day. When sodium restriction alone is inadequate, oral diuretics pyranolactone and furosemide are used. In refractory cirrhotic ascites, which is defined as persistence of ascites despite sodium restriction and maximal diuretic use, pharmacologic therapy including addition of mitodrine, an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist, or clonidine to diuretic therapy. When medical therapy alone is insufficient, refractory ascites can be managed by repeated large-volume paracentesis or transjugular intrahepatic peritoneal shunt. Now let's look into the complications. These include spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which is a common and potentially lethal complication of cirrhotic ascites. Patients generally note an increase in abdominal girth, abdominal tenderness in 40% of patients, and rebound tenderness is uncommon. Patients may present with fever, nausea, vomiting, or the new onset of exacerbation of pre-existing hepatic encephalopathy. Follow me for more videos and JM is the key. Adios!